What's up, everybody? It's Josh coming at you from Nerd Ventures Tower, and the Star Wars leaks just keep on coming. And honestly, I could get used to this. There are two massive new leaks out there that I want to cover in this video. One pertains to the Kenobi show and the character of Qui-Gon Jinn and some details about the fight between Obi-Wan and Vader. And the other stuff has to do with Mandalorian Season 3. They are both incredibly spicy. They hold some spoilers for things that will happen in those shows. So spoiler warning, but let's get into it. And let us begin with the reports of the Kenobi show. Now, this is coming from Making Star Wars. Actually, both of these scoops are coming from Making Star Wars, um, but I'm going to check them out on Bespin Bulletin just because I, I actually like the layout better on uh, BespinBulletin.com. It's a little bit visually better to look at for videos. This is pretty crazy. It has to do with the fight, but also Qui-Gon Jinn. It says here, the report comes from Making Star Wars who reveals the first confrontation confrontation in the series of the former master and apprentice does not go well for Kenobi. And following the defeat, he's more determined than ever to stop the Sith Lord. Kenobi and his fallen Padawan apparently clash once again on a moon of Mustafar, one that's described as a rocky moon, and that during the fight, there is a rocky moment as Qui-Gon Jinn speaks with his former Padawan during the fight, giving him words of encouragement similar, similar to Mickey and Balboa. The report adds that once the adventure has come to an end, Kenobi returns home to Tatooine, and in his cave, he is finally able to see the ghost of his former master, Qui-Gon Jinn. You may recall that I reported just a couple of short weeks ago that Jinn would appear as a Force ghost and not just a disembodied voice. However, according to the report, Jin will communicate with Kenobi as simply a voice at various moments in the series, but early on when Kenobi is broken and faithless, as Ewan McGregor recently put it, he is unable to, com to communicate with his master despite calling out for him. And so let's stop for a moment here and discuss what this means. I mean, first of all, round one, Vader wins. You know what I mean? That's pretty wild, but also interesting. I like it quite a bit. It sets up so that the second fight will have Kenobi maybe coming out on top, which again could explain the lines in A New Hope when Vader says, when last I left, you were the, or I was but the learner and you were but the master. And this might have something to do with force knowledge or power that Kenobi taps into, perhaps via his training with Qui-Gon Jinn, or perhaps even just because of the voice that Qui-Gon will then, you know, help Kenobi during that fight. I think that is absolutely amazing, and I'm really, really interested in what the scene at the end of the series will actually look like as it plays out with Qui-Gon actually appearing as a Force ghost and Kenobi being able to actually see him for the first time, which would, again, kind of set us up for Obi-Wan later on in the original trilogy, you know, having that Force ghost ability to help Luke Skywalker. I really like it. It's like poetry. It rhymes. It feels right. And one of the things I continue to be impressed with with regards to the lead weeks uh, for Kenobi is that a lot of this stuff seems like it's not just, you know, good fan service -y stuff. It's not just stuff that would be fun for the story, but stuff that feels very Star Wars is using the sort of influence of all of the material around it and perhaps even enhancing some of the things that we will revisit, you know, in A New Hope and in Revenge of the Sith. And I think this show is perhaps setting up to be this perfect little anchor point between Revenge of the Sith uh, and A New Hope. And it might be like a really fun little watch party thing where like you watch Revenge of the Sith then you watch the Kenobi show, then you watch A New Hope. I mean, that kind of feels like it's going to be a really, really nice package of content. But now let's talk about these crazy leaks for The Mandalorian Season 3. They are fascinating. Again, I am looking at this on BestmanBulletin.com. He is covering a scoop uh, that does come from making Star Wars. So let's just read here and then we'll break it down. Apparent set photos from the third season of The Mandalorian hit the web today. And the most interesting of the few featured images shows some red helmets rumored to be linked to the Praetorian Guards. Making Star Wars did not leak the images, but added that they were told of filming in Long Island Beach this week and that at this location, Din Djarin was facing off against Praetorian guards. They added that their source told them that the guards, rocking weapons from The Last Jedi, stood alongside red stormtroopers with Mandalorian-inspired helmets. In my opinion, the helmets seen in the images above look more Mandalorian-inspired than anything else. It's also worth noting that it was previously revealed by Dave Filoni that the Mandalorian show the origins of the First Order, something that has strongly been hinted at, especially in the second season when we saw some botched cloning attempts that somewhat resembled Supreme Leader Snoke 
and Emperor Palpatine. Praetorian Guards appearing in the third season is definitely a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. It also leads one to wonder who or what the guards are protecting and raises some questions. Are we going to see Supreme Leader Snoke? Are we going to see a possible Snoke predecessor? These are some thrilling questions and ones that I can't wait to learn the answers to. Now, they talk about in the article, there are two other images this one which looks to be like inside of a tie fighter or perhaps some kind of a gun uh you know part of a ship and then you've got this here which appears to just be sort of a imperial looking corridor but now let's break this down like what could all of this mean i mean it looks really cool the mandalorian red looking helmets look cool and i think that you know what bespin bulletin is sort of implying there is that he believes these helmets are not praetorian guard helmets but rather the red stormtroopers that are said to be also there with the praetorian guards guarding something I think it's really fair to say that it seems like this will be setting up the First Order and kind of where we go with the sequels. And I know that's going to trigger some people. I mean, if they continue to do it in sort of cool ways like this, though, I'm not really going to mind. And I really do wonder, is Thrawn going to play some kind of a role in what is going on here? And what I would personally enjoy is if, yes, this was all stuff that was established by the Emperor, but perhaps Thrawn now being in charge of the Imperial Remnant is using it in a different kind of way. Maybe he is doing the contingency and trying to bring the Emperor back, or maybe he's just co-opting all of the resources that the Emperor had, and he's using it for different purposes. And to me, a lot of this comes down to Mandalore. Like, what's the deal with Mandalore? I feel like it's pretty obvious that that's where Din is heading in Season 3. Is this perhaps some kind of Imperial installation on Mandalore, and the Empire is hiding out on that planet after, like, convincing most of the galaxy that the planet's been destroyed? I mean, this is something that we have set up in The Mandalorian Season 2. Boba talks about how everything goes there, dies, and just that the planet's completely glass, but Bo-Katan kind of makes it seem like there's something else going on there. Don't believe everything you've heard. And at the time of the Season uh, 2, of the Mandalorian. She's currently trying to get all the Mandalorians together to go help get the planet back or to go to Mandalore. So there's definitely more to this story of Mandalore. Either way, this stuff seems really, really cool and it seems like way more involved and amped up than a lot of the stuff we got in Book of Boba Fett. And I think the last thing I want to leave you with is that if Mandalorian Season 3 comes out and it just absolutely slaps and it's this incredible series that does so much for the Filoni-verse and for setting up other parts of connective tissue, like I'm going to completely forgive Book of Boba Fett because it really feels like Book of Boba Fett is kind of a placeholder show. I know, you know, there are a lot of people that really like that show, but it didn't like really push things forward in the way that Mandalorian season two did. And the only parts that really did were technically parts of Mandalorian season three. So I don't know, man, I'm very excited for Mandalorian season three and I can't wait to see what all of this actually means. If you have some thoughts about what it means, let me know in the comments section below. If you like this video, I'd Definitely wouldn't mind you smashing like on it helps me out in the YouTube algorithm and I hope wherever this video finds you at that you are having an awesome and a nerdy day and I'll see you in the next video.